Welcome to Worship at Christ Church Presbyterian. We're grateful you've decided to be here with us, and we hope you'll be encouraged as you participate in today's service. So join with us now as Pastor Robbie Hendrick leads us in worship of the one true and living God. Well, I am not Charles McClure, but we need to pray for him because he's not here. So, but we will move forward. Glad to have you tonight. Thanks for coming and being with us as we close out the Lord's Day. Uh, What a blessing it is for us to gather once again this evening to worship the Lord. Let me give you a couple of quick announcements, and these, of course, were talked about even this morning, uh, that there is an opportunity for us to come and now re-engage in Sunday school That's going to be happening uh, on Sunday mornings starting really at 10 o'clock. It's going to be in this building right here in this room from 10 to 1045. And of course, don't forget to join us on Sundays as well or on Wednesday nights as well. And there's an opportunity for you to register for that, which should be on a sheet of paper somewhere fairly close to where you're sitting in the registration pad. Uh, Also, don't forget that I mentioned this morning that a letter is being sent out this week with officer nominations. Uh, or elections, we have called a congregational meeting set for the 14th of February in order for us to be able to uh, vote on officers for this year. Uh, Also, Ryan and Haley, our new youth director, is going to be landing, looks like boots on the ground, around the 14th of February. Be praying for that transition as well. Uh, We've come here tonight to worship the Lord. Our scriptural call to worship comes from Psalm 44, verse 8. In God we have boasted continually... And we will give thanks to your name forever. Let's do that even now. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful to be able to close out this, the Lord's Day, in worship of you. What a blessing that is for us. And so, Lord, we pray even now that you would guard our hearts, that we focus upon you and you alone. 
And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene in our family song collection number 13. Let's stand and sing. Let's pray together. Father, how marvelous you are and how wonderful you are. As we gather even this evening to come and to worship you, Lord, we are thankful for all of the many, many blessings that you bestowed upon us. Lord, we thank you for simply who you are, a God who is loving and caring and merciful and gracious, a God who is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love the God who is the creator and sustainer of the universe, who upholds everything by the power of your word. Father, what a blessing it is for us to give you praise. Lord, it is impossible for us to escape from your presence or control, and we're grateful for that too. Lord, it is our distinct privilege as your people to be under your authority, under your righteousness, under your mercy, and under your grace. Father, we praise you, for you are the God of all wisdom and power and holiness. And Lord, when we think through who you are, it simply calms our fears for what's going on around us. And Lord, we do come even tonight and pray that you would continue to draw us closer to you. Lord, we are a sinful people. And we gather on the Sabbath day and we corporately confess our sins. And Lord, every day we individually confess our sins to you. And we're grateful for all that you have done in our lives. Most importantly, forgiving our sin and giving us eternal life. We are thankful 
for the gift of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins. We thank you for the promises that you've given us in your word that not one will be snatched from your hand. We thank you for the promise of the pardon of assurance that you give us, that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, we boast not in our works. We boast not in our freedoms. We boast in the cross of Christ alone. And Lord, we thank you that even as we bring our petitions to you, that they do not fall on deaf ears. Not because of who we are, but because of who you are. A God who loves and cares for his people. And Lord, even tonight, as we have prayed so often, we do pray for the lost. We pray that your word would go forth with power and that people would come to the knowledge of saving faith in Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we pray every week, we pray that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, once again, we also come to you and we do pray for this country. We pray by your grace that you would stop the pandemic and by your mercy that you would find favor in this land, in the midst of a land in seemingly great turmoil. We pray that by your holiness that you would drive us as a nation back to you. That the scriptures would be our only rule for faith and practice. That love would be the foundation of every relationship. And that we would seek your kingdom first. We do pray for all of our civic leaders that you would give them reliance upon you alone for their call of duty. And Lord, we Pray specifically for those that are in Washington, D.C. How tough it is for those that you've called to be your very own to stand firm in the faith that you've given them. We pray for strength for them to not waver. And Lord, at the same time, we pray for those who don't know you and that you would drive them to their knees in full reliance upon you for their salvation. We do pray for the sick, for those that have been affected by the pandemic. We thank you that Oliver is out of ICU and in a regular room. We do pray, Lord, for comfort for any and all of those who have lost loved ones. We do continue to pray for our military and our missionaries. And Lord, we pray for our church, that we would always be a church that will grow in your grace and walk in your truth And that we would be a light on a hill, not only to Evans, but to all of the surrounding cities of Augusta, Martinez, Grovetown, even into South Carolina. Father, constantly remind us of our need for you and constantly shower your presence upon us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In our collection still, number three, number three, we sing of glorying in the cross of Christ. Let's stand to sing.
Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6. Uh, yes, we are going to be wrapping up Galatians tonight. Nobody is happier about that than I think I am. Uh, we have been in it for quite some time, but we are beginning to cross the finish line. And what a blessing that is for us to be able to say that we've gone through all of Galatians together. Uh, let me give you just a little bit of a background. If you've been with us at all, this will be a repetition, of course, but uh, Galatians is... The book as a whole, or the letter as a whole that Paul wrote, really was about justification being by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ alone. There was this obvious push all of the time of the Judaizers adding basically obedience to the law to salvation. And this, was a, this letter was a push against them constantly. Uh, they wanted circumcision to be a part of salvation. If you wanted to be a part of, the, of, of salvation, then you must not just only have faith in God, you must also obey the law. Part of that law was being circumcised uh, even as an adult. Now, we've walked through Paul's discussion of these three areas of life, legalism versus licensure versus liberty, and we've viewed the outcome of all three of them, legalism being following the law, getting circumcised in order to profess you know, Christ as your Savior, a licensure, which is following the flesh, doing whatever you want, and then the liberty, which is following the Spirit or being led by the Spirit. And we spent a lot of time talking about those three ways of living. Two of them are nothing more than forms of slavery. Uh, legalism leading to frustration because we can't keep the law, and so we just keep working harder and harder to try to achieve that spot. And then licensure leading to emptiness because we can't find peace whenever we, quote-unquote, do whatever we want. It still leaves a void and a hole. Now, Galatians lists 16 ways that licensure manifests itself and then adds the phrase, and things such as these, which tells us there's a lot more than that. And there are nine listed liberty manifested things, and again, such as these is listed in that as well. Tonight, Paul wraps up his letter to the Galatians by talking about, if anything, when it comes to our behavior, what should we be focusing on? What should we be boasting about uh, when it comes to our life, what should we be proud of? Galatians 6, starting with verse 11 here, the inerrant and infallible word of God. See with what large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that you may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation." And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Let's pray. Father, again, Father, once again, we come to you. We're so grateful for your word, and we do pray even now as we study it and we open it up, that you would open up our hearts to receive it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the word uh, boast is really an interesting term here. There is no English equivalent. It's one that boast is about the closest that we can get to it. Uh, but it means really to speak with exaggeration and pride, to be proud of the possession of something, whatever that is, fill in the blank with whatever it is. Now, why would Paul say don't boast except that maybe there was something of boasting going on with the people. Why would Paul give instruction to not boast unless that's exactly what the people were doing? And, of course, they were. It does seem like there was a lot of boasting going on during this time. On one side, there was boasting about following the law. Listen, you must do what we do in order to be saved. And they were proud of the possession of, in this case, following the law, having the law, pushing the law, continuing to encourage people to follow the law. On the other hand... The other side of that coin, there was a lot of boasting about not following the law, right? I'll do whatever I want. Look at me. I'm okay. You're okay. Let's just be okay. Go do whatever you want, uh, and you should do whatever you want too. 
Now, Paul wanted to make sure as he ends this letter, and we've talked about both of these sides for quite some time, but Paul wanted to make sure that these last couple of verses, the ones written, the Bible says, in his own handwriting, let me give an aside here that really has nothing to do with the sermon, but there are theologians who believe that actually John Mark wrote the letter as Paul was dictating it until he got to this point. And then Paul says, give it to me. And then he wrote, see what I write with my own hand. So that last part was really written, handwritten by Paul. Other theologians says, no, Paul just was being emphatic and the writing got bigger. And I always want to ask people, is the writing in your Bible bigger at that point? When Paul says, see how big these letters are with my own hand. It's not in mine. But I just wonder if there was others that are like that. Anyway, that's the side that has no value for the sermon whatsoever. Just one of those points that hopefully will bring you back from the sleep. Okay, so being justified before God is not about following the law. It's about God's grace to the individual and sending the Lord Jesus Christ to die for sin, which we know comes from faith. Now, the reason I say that so quickly is because we've been saying this now for about 12 weeks in a row. So here's the question. If we're going to boast in particular about our relationship with God, it is not the law that we should boast about or the myth that we are okay to not follow the law. If we are to boast, Paul is saying, if you're going to boast, let it be in the plan of God to save sinners. Let our boasting be in the cross of Christ alone. For the gospel, to be the gospel, the cross has to stand alone. Now, here's the problem with that. As Paul is writing this letter, there were two sides that were boasting over two different, completely different things. And so what do we see? People were boasting in their own merit, in their own work. We know the Judaizers were demanding that Galatians be circumcised in order to be saved. But why were they doing this? It really wasn't just about trying to get these people into the kingdom. It really was about nickels and noses of counting heads to say, look at all of the people that we've saved. Why were they boasting about the law? There are several reasons. Some more really targeted toward vanity than others. Let's dig into a few. I'm at letter A. There is the fame for the work, the idea of doing God's work, being good evangelist. Nothing is exciting as being a good evangelist and watching people come to faith in Christ. That's never been my uh, spiritual gift per se. I mean, I have shared the gospel with many people, but uh, I'm not the guy normally that brings people in to Christ. I mean, I know Jesus does the work, but at the same time, I'm usually the one that takes the believer and drives them deeper. I'm the discipler. I'm not the evangelist per se, but there are a lot of people out there that are highly gifted in evangelism. I've watched people in this church do this now for the last three years. It's been pretty incredible to watch from time to time. The idea of being good evangelists, there is some idea that there were people that were boasting in God, kind of because God was using them to reach other people. Look at what God is doing uh, in me and with me. Uh, and it's not only what we are called to do to be evangelists, but it has the potential to make us grow in our boasting, but not in our boasting of who God is, but in our boasting of ourselves. Now, this was authentic uh, conversions. It was just the fact that we kind of puffed ourselves up. I'm talking about the people living in Paul's day because of how they chose to look at how God was calling people to himself. The more successful we are in evangelism, the more we boast about it. Let me give you an example of this. In my previous church, we was a small town of about 50,000 people, and uh, actually the entire county was only 100,000, and 50,000 of them lived within a six-mile radius of the church which I served. But I got together once a month with about five other pastors from five other churches, different denominations across the board. I mean, we were the only PCA church in town. And, and, and we got together and we would talk all the time about how things were going in our churches and, and you know, who had left our church and landed at their church and who had left their church and landed at our church. And, and so we had these conversations. We prayed for one another. We encouraged one another. And we basically began as iron sharpens iron to talk through some things. And one of the guys was in a different denomination and 
When I started talking about going to Presbytery meetings and General Assembly, he said, look, he said, I don't go to any of those meetings in my denomination anymore. And I said, really, why? He said, because every time I go, they only want to know the numbers. That's all they want to know. How many conversions have you had since the last time we met? How many people have joined your church? How many children have you uh, been able to witness to? And, and he said, I, I, I grow so weary of it because it's this constant movement of numbers all the time. And, and these are true conversions. It's not like they're fake, but at the end of the day, the conversion number was more important than even the discipleship of the people. And this denomination was beginning to grow, really explode, because of the numbers. One of my best friends on the planet is a member of the largest denomination in the world, and he boasts about that. And he says, listen, our denomination is the largest denomination on the planet. And I have to remind him, yes, that's true, but yours is the only denomination that you can be a member of your denomination and my denomination at the same time. So when you join your denomination, you are never taken off the rolls. No wonder you have the largest denomination in the world. You walked through and started checking people's names. Here's the phone book. Call them up. Let them join. Here you go. Now, I'm kidding with him a little bit, but it's true. The largest denomination in the world will let you believe whatever you want to believe as long as you join. That's for them, and that's okay. It's not the way it normally works. And I think the reason for that is because the denomination as a whole begins to boast about the numbers. All right? What's happening here is Paul is saying, you guys are boasting about the numbers of people you're circumcising to get into the kingdom. You need to stop that. The second reason that people boast, not in the cross, but in other things, is really fear of persecution. Now, watch how this works. The more I argue over being circumcised in order to be saved, the less I'm persecuted by somebody who claims that you don't have to be circumcised to be saved. Remember all the persecution taught we used this morning. Look with verse 12. Only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Most of the time, people were counting the nickels and the noses so that they would not be persecuted by the other side. The way to do that is to make sure that everybody knows that you are the one following the law. Listen, I am circumcised. My whole family is circumcised. Everybody that comes into the life of the church is circumcised that I bring into the life of the church. What is that doing? That's not just boasting about the nickels and numbers. It's also protecting yourself from being persecuted by the side that says you don't have to be circumcised. And that was the fight that they were in all the time. What's so amazing to me is when we think of the sufferings of the early church, we often think of all of the persecution that came really from the Romans. But we must understand that there was a lot of suffering going on inside the church. The first attacks actually came from the Jews. Stephen was stoned by the Sanhedrin, not by the Romans. Paul, before his conversion, was dragging Christians out of their homes and arresting them. That was a Jew continuing to persecute Christians. Some of the most severe persecution that Christians faced came from the Jewish people. And as the church spread through Asia Minor, Jewish persecution spread with it. But there was one easy way to avoid it, and that was obey the law. If it says that we must be circumcised, let's get circumcised. That just keeps people off our back. What made devout Jews angry was the people who failed to maintain the proper boundaries between Jews and Gentiles. And yet even Gentiles were welcomed into the life of the church if they did one thing. What was that? Get circumcised. The Judaizer said that circumcision was necessary to belong to God's covenant, but their real motivation was simple fear. They were afraid of what other Jews would say if they found out that they were not circumcised. It's just much easier to defend their involvement with Christianity if they could say that the Gentiles in their house did keep the law of Moses. Even though Paul kept saying, you don't have to. 
Deep down, they were not willing to be persecuted for the cause of Christ. The cross has a way of inviting persecution. And we spent a lot of time talking about that this morning. It simply arouses opposition because it says that we are sinners under God's curse. And it tells us that we need someone else to die for our sins. That there is nothing we can do to save ourselves, only to trust in Jesus. And that message is not very palatable to a lot of people. People generally do not like being told that they are sinners who need a Savior. And if I can look like the world as much as I can, then I will not be persecuted as much as I might. And that was the thought process of the Judaizers. And sometimes it's the thought process of us today. Let me give you an example of this. Whenever we hug the scriptures really, really tight and we say, this is the way, walk ye in it. And the world shows us something different. In order for us to not be persecuted, you, knew, you know what we do? We don't go over to the world. We just, we, we move over a little bit. Just enough so that the world can see that we're still okay. Different, but okay. And so we give ground but not a whole lot of ground so that we're not persecuted and we still think we're okay. And you know what the world does? They move a little farther out. And then you know what we do? We move a little farther out. And before you know it, the world is way out here and we're somewhere in the middle and Christianity is way over here. And we wake up and we think, how did I get to this spot? And the answer is fear of persecution. We did not want people to persecute us because of our faith. And for a lot of reasons, people were obeying the law simply out of persecution because they did not want to be persecuted by the people that were around them. Boasting about doing God's work while at the same time, quote unquote, obeying the law to keep people off their backs. Hiding the fear of persecution. Two ways that boasting is bad. There is a third, and it's what I'll call flesh success. And it sounds a little bit like A, but I'm going to say that it's not. Look at verse 12. Verse 12 says, Why do they keep the law? To make a good showing in the flesh. Now, the reason this is a little bit different than letter A is because this is, quote-unquote, a good showing or the appearance of success, but it's not real success. Authentic success of the gospel moving forward is actually not happening. These are not true conversions. These are people that, are, that get emotionally excited or even attached to a movement, and they join the movement without ever professing Christ as their Savior, and everybody says that it's fine. It really is the nickels and noses on the bad side, which is just get as many people in here as we can so that we can show ourselves to be successful. It is wrapped around performance and perfections. It is outward success with no inward change in the hearts and souls of people or even progress being made. This is the trap of giving people what they want instead of what they need when it comes to being a preacher or a teacher of the gospel or someone who is just responsible to share the gospel. And as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's you. Okay, And what we begin to do is we water down the message in such a way, number one, we don't want to be persecuted for it. That's stupid. Why do you believe that? And we also want to be careful not to offend them and then all of a sudden there's this, well, let's do all that we can to just get them into the kingdom. We'll worry about everything else later. And so we begin to give them what their itching ears want to hear. And we watch the church explode with no foundation. And you know what happens to those churches? We've seen them, right? Many of them are empty today. It's very shallow teaching. It's 100% love of God and 0% holiness of God. It's the idea that Jesus is my friend and we hang together and you should meet him and he's awesome. And yes, this is true, but he is also holy. And we spent a lot of time again this morning 
And we know that he does not clear the guilty. And we also know that we are all guilty. People need to hear that. And they need to hear it loud and clear. This is not the idea of saying, you know, Jesus is cool. You need to give him a chance. Or saying that God's love is unconditional. That salvation and grace are free. Listen, salvation and grace is not free. It cost God his son. It's just we didn't have to pay for it. I tell you guys all the time, you're in a grocery store, your child wants a candy bar, you buy the candy bar, the child looks at you and says, wow, I got this free candy bar. You're thinking, no. The reason it was free is because I paid for it. It was only free to you. It wasn't free to me. And this is the way God looks at and does salvation. It is not free to him. It cost him the life of his son. A very high price was paid. It's free to us because he is gracious. This idea of flesh success is the idea of just do anything to get them into the kingdom. Make the message so palatable that they can't resist it, even if you have to fudge on it a little bit. Whatever we need to do to make us look successful, that's what we need to do. Now listen, sometimes we will see this mentality, even, and this is a, a little bit of a tangent, but not much. Hang on here with me. Sometimes we see this same mentality in raising our children. What do we want to do? Just make them obey. Make them act right and do right in front of other people. Not for their soul's sake, but so that I look good as a parent. That's the most important thing. I mean, let's face it. I'm a pastor in this church. If my kids don't act right and do right, that's a reflection on me. I can't have that. I'll never forget the day that God almost audibly looked me in the face and said, will you stop it? That is the worst mentality of parenting I have ever heard. Maybe those were not his words, but that's what I heard. This is not about you. This is about your boy. This is about your girl. This is about the sin that is within them. This is about how to raise them. This is not about you. Forget about how it reflects on you. Do it for them. Change my whole mentality in a 100-yard walk between church and school. As I had been called, you need to come get your boy. And I'm thinking, how in the world? Is my ministry going to be a success if this is the way he's going to act? And then I thought, okay, Lord, I get it. I repent. It's all about my sin and his sin, and it needs to be adjusted. What do we do as parents? We think I will look successful to the people around me as a parent if I can just make them do what they need to do when they're in front of other people. This is called authoritative parenting, and it does not produce long-term success. And there will be a day when a child will just simply say no to the rules and to you. The same is true with the church. If we water down the message, if we do everything that we can to attract as many at first as we can, but we are only an inch deep and a mile wide, it will only lead to frustration later. And yeah, a lot of people may come into the life of the church, but you know what's going to happen? They're going to think, is this it? Is this all we got? I don't know that I'm growing. I cannot tell you how many people have come in the doors of any church that I've served because our denomination is wrought with great teachers and said to me, I finally begin to understand a little bit more about the Bible because you're not just saying Jesus loves you every week. Well, that's true. I'm going to say it, but I'm going to say much more. I refuse to be an inch deep and a mile wide because it only leads to frustration in the hearts of people. And at the end of the day, boasting about the numbers, Paul even says, not the thing to boast over. This is actually what we see with the Judaizers who said to the Gentiles, it is necessary to circumcise them. And the Bible says, and to order them to keep the law of Moses. This is Acts 15, 5. 
The irony was that the Judaizers couldn't even keep the law themselves. That's what Paul says in the passage. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. See what we did? See what we did with him? Boasting should not, does not, come from fame that we get for doing God's work or from fear of persecution or the flesh success that we have by watering down the message. Paul gets it right here. What does he say? Boasting only comes from the work of Christ, which is the cross alone. That's Roman number number two. Paul's boasting is in the work of Christ. Look at verse 14. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, here's the problem that we see. Boasting in the cross was like boasting in something that did not matter at all. Or worse, something that was actually demeaning. And it confused everybody that read it and tried to understand it. You know, I get boasting in the numbers. I get boasting over not being persecuted. I, what I don't get is how you can boast in the cross because the cross really didn't mean anything. In fact, it was kind of a negative thing. I gave you the Webster definition of boast, which means to speak with exaggeration and pride, to be proud in the possession of. It's difficult to kind of capture the meaning of the Greek word for boast because there is no precise equivalent in English. But here's what John Stott says. He says, listen, to boast in, to glory in, to trust in, to rejoice in, and to revel in, and to live for. If you take all of that and put it together... The object of our boast or glory fills our horizons, engrosses our attentions, and absorbs our time and our energy. In a word, our glory is our obsession. How can we glory in, rejoice in, revel in, live for, and be proud of the cross. Boasting in the cross was very unique. In fact, I bet Paul was the first one to ever even put this to pen. Paul refused to live for any of the things that people usually live for. He did not boast about his popularity, his intellect, his influence, his appearance, his income. did not matter. He didn't even boast about his circumcision. His abilities, his accomplishments of planting churches. Boasting in the cross was very unique. We hadn't seen it before. It was also very ugly. Christians are used to thinking today about the cross as something noble or even beautiful. They're in a lot of churches Obviously so. Uh, We wear them around our necks. We have them on keychains. I mean, crosses are everywhere, and they should be, and that's fine. I'm not really challenging any of that. But to the ancient people, it was nearly the ugliest thing imaginable in their life. The cross was the ultimate humiliation. It would be like boasting in a burnt cake that you looked at and did not even recognize it as a cake. Look at what I made right here, this beautiful thing. What is it? It's a cake. Doesn't look like a cake. It's burnt. No, no, no. This is my pride. This is my joy. This is what I revel in. This is what I obsess in right here, this thing. And you're looking at it going, well, okay, great. It's like boasting as the team who lost the championship game. Look at us. We lost the game. Yeah. Or taking your worst moment in life and telling everyone about it with great pride. The cross was a symbol of humiliation. The Romans considered the cross degrading. It was the absolute worst way to die. It was disgusting. Most of the time, they left people up on crosses and birds ate the flesh. If they didn't, then they would at least take them down and just throw them in a ditch. 
Crosses were lined up on the Roman roads coming into Rome so that anyone coming into Rome could see the price that was paid if you didn't act right. And late at night, they lit the crosses to line the streets with light for royalty. This was the cross that Paul is saying, this is what I live for. This is what I revel in. This is my obsession. The cross was despicable. And if anyone was convicted, no one ever chose the cross as a way to die. It was detestable. It was disgraceful. And here Paul is saying, it is the cross alone that we as believers should boast in. In his commentary, F.F. F. Bruce says this, The object of Paul's present boasting was, by ordinary standards of his day, the most ignoble of all objects. A matter of unrelieved shame, not of boasting. It is difficult after 16 centuries and more during which the cross had been a sacred symbol to realize the unspeakable horror and loathing which the very mention or thought of the cross provoked in Paul's day. The word crux was unmentionable in polite Roman conversation. Even when one was being condemned to death by crucifixion, the sentence used, an archaic formula which served as a sort of euphemism, hang him on the unlucky tree. Nobody even said the word cross. They never really said the word crucifixion. They just said, hang him on the unlucky tree because it was so degrading. It was so bad. The cross should have been an embarrassment to the early church. The founder of Christianity had been executed like a low-life criminal, but instead of denying this or covering it up, Christians actually advertised it. This is what gives so much meaning to Paul when he says in chapter 2, verse 20 of Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Or in chapter 3, verse 1, when he says, Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. He kept right on boasting through the rest of all of the epistles, all of the letters that he wrote. 1 Corinthians 1, 23, We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews. Why? They didn't understand it. And foolishness to the Gentiles. Why? Because it was the lowest form of death. But it is the very thing that we cling to. Because to them, it represented despicable death. But to those in Christ, it represents liberating life. And for us, we have nothing else. Nothing in my hands I bring. Only to the cross I cling. 1 Corinthians 2, 2, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. While the Romans thought it was shameful and the Jews uh, saw, saw it as something that they would not even talk about, Paul actually boasts about it. Listen, Paul spoke of the message of the cross. 1 Corinthians 1.18 for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. The cross is not despicable. It is the very power of God. Paul spoke of the offense of the cross in Galatians 5. Brothers, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. Paul spoke of the triumph of the cross in Colossians 2. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, Jesus made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. It is the lowest thing possible that Jesus used to attain the highest goal, and that is to conquer sin and death on behalf of his people. Hallelujah and amen. Paul spoke of the wonder of the cross in Philippians 2, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The cross is not just something to boast about. It is the only thing we have. And it is the only thing that we must boast about. 
And it means that God loves us enough to die for us. And that he saved us through the death of his own dear son. The cross means that we've been redeemed. And that Christ has paid the whole price for our salvation. And that we now have forgiveness of sin. And an atoning sacrifice to take away our guilt has been made by the one who went to the cross. It means that we are justified. That God now accepts us as righteous in his sight. The cross is the picture of God's wrath being turned to another. And now the cross stands and when we look at it we see our innocence before him. We can boast about Christ crucified only if we renounce anything and everything that we can do to save ourselves. The minute we begin to think that there's some other way, the value of the cross, as despicable as it may seem, goes to nothing. Let me give you another quote from John Stott. The truth is that we cannot boast in ourselves and in the cross simultaneously. If we boast in ourselves and in our ability to save ourselves, we shall never boast in the cross and in the ability of Christ crucified to save us. We have to choose. Only if we have humbled ourselves as hell-deserving sinners shall we give up boasting of ourselves, fly to the cross for salvation, and spend the rest of our days glorifying in the cross. Paul boasted in the cross alone, which was scary in his day because of the persecution that was coming. Look at verse 17. I'm almost done. Hang in there. Verse 17, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. What does this mean? It seems pretty obvious. This is a statement and a warning to every single Christian, for it shows what kind of treatment we can expect when we boast in the cross. The Greek word for these, this word marks is the word stigmata. It, we, he had the marks of persecution on his body, the very things that the Judaizers were trying to avoid. Acts, 14, Acts chapter 14, verse 8 says, He has been stoned and left for dead in Lystra. Do you know where this is talking about, Paul? You know where Lystra is located? In Galatia. You know where Paul's letter is written to? The churches in Galatia. You understand what's happening here? Paul has been among them. He has been beaten. He has been left for dead. He has the marks of persecution on his body. And now he sits and he writes them a letter that says, It does not matter about these marks. I will still boast in the cross alone. Persecution meant nothing to him. Why was Paul such a marked man? Because people were offended by the preaching of the cross. And we've already talked about this. People don't want to know that they need a Savior. They get offended when we talk about it. People think that they're okay. They don't think there's a God. They don't think there's sin. They don't think that there's judgment. And people believe that God forgives and forgets, even without repentance. And we must clear up that misconception of their thinking. If we ask why Paul was such a marked man, the answer is that people were offended by the preaching of the cross. This word stigmata was sometimes used really to refer to a, a branding of a slave. It was one of the ways that the owner of a slave would brand the people so that everybody knew that that slave belonged to the master. And here's what Paul is saying. The marks that I have on my body are nothing more than a brand, a tattoo of my heart before the Lord. And everybody needs to know I belong to him. John Calvin said, For even as earthly warfare has its decorations with which generals honor the bravery of a soldier, so Christ our leader has his own marks of which he makes good use in decorating and honoring some of his followers. These marks, however, are very different from the others, for they have the nature of the cross. And in the sight of the world, they are disgraceful. But to us, they're life. 
G. Campbell Morgan, who is another theologian, died in 1945, wrote this, it is the crucified man that can preach the cross. Said Thomas, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, I will not believe. You remember Thomas asking Jesus to see the wounds? What Thomas said of Christ, the world is saying about the church. And the world is also saying to every believer, unless I see in your hands the print of the nails, I will not believe. Unless the world sees the marks of persecution in the church, they will not believe. Unless the church sees the marks of persecution in the believer, they will not believe. You must understand this. It is true. It is the person who has died with Christ that has the most freedom to teach, to preach, to talk about, and to share the cross of Christ. We must not be afraid of persecution. And it is very important for us to understand what Paul is saying as he ends this letter. We cling to the only thing we can, and that is the cross of Christ and what it represents in our life and in our hearts. And we will bear the marks of a believer. And we've talked about the marks before out of the book of John. Loving God, being a disciple of Christ, following his commands. But those marks are also the marks of persecution. And what a blessing it is for us to be able to stand like the apostles who were brought in and flogged for teaching and said, don't teach about Jesus anymore. And they left doing what? Praising God that they were seen worthy enough to be persecuted. And then they kept preaching about Christ. That's our call as a church. That's our call as individuals. That's why I love how Paul ends the letter. Verse 18, the grace of our Lord, Jesus Christ, be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for your word. And Lord, we're thankful that in it you teach us what it means to rejoice, to revel, to boast, to be glad in the cross, the very thing that for so many generations and so many years just wasn't a good thing to even look at. But Lord, it is the cross, what Jesus did on the cross, that has given us life. And so we cling to it. And in that, may that be the only thing we boast about. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of response, of course, is coming out of our Family Songs collection. And it's number 32, The Power of the Cross. Let's stand and sing together.
now receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us for Worship at Christ Church Presbyterian. We're grateful that you were able to take part in worship with us, and we hope that the time you've spent here has been an encouragement to you. Please remember to stay in touch, and if there's something you need or something you'd like for us to lift up in prayer, call us at 706-210-9090. Of course, please continue to pray for each other and for those who lead us that they would seek God in their decisions. And don't forget to come back again to our website, myccp.faith, or the Christ Church Facebook page to be a part of worship at Christ Church Presbyterian.